What's up, guys? Max here back with a brand new episode of the Scuttlebutt Show. I hope you're all doing great out there, wherever you are, whatever you're doing. I hope you're having a wonderful day. Today, I am super excited to bring on a very special guest that we have. You know, a couple weeks ago, we had uh, Ben Milligan on the show to talk about his book, By Water Beneath the Walls. And afterwards, I had a wonderful conversation with our guest today, who has tons of great things to talk about and share with us. And I'm really excited to announce him on the show today. Please give a warm welcome to our guest, Duncan Smith. Duncan, how are you doing? Max, I'm doing well. Thank you for having me on your show today. Absolutely. It's really my pleasure and uh, a pleasure for our audience here who is joining us live. And I'll be monitoring the chat. So if anyone wants to jump in with a question or a comment while the show is going, please do so. We would love to hear from you. Duncan, for anybody who doesn't know, uh, I've been talking about you a little bit and, and, you know, warming up the audience for today's episode, but I know we have a lot of people joining us today from LinkedIn and other places. Can you tell us a little bit about yourself, please? My background, 32 years as a SEAL, uh, five of that active duty, went to the reserves to attend graduate school, but spent 10 years very involved as a reservist, would deploy each year overseas. And then 9-11 uh, happened. I came back on active duty, did another 17 years. So of my 32 years, uh, no combat deployments until after 9-11. And at that point in time, five combat deployments. Retired just about three and a half years ago, almost four years ago now. I'm a husband, a father. Uh, my wife, like yours, we have a little bit in common. Both our wives work in the healthcare uh, arena. And I've got three kids. I'm a Navy dad times three uh, and also a grandfather. Um, so that's just a little that's bit awesome. of background. I'm also currently the uh, proud to say the executive director of the SEAL Family Foundation, a charity dedicated to supporting the families of SEALs and the Gold Star families, those those families that have lost someone from Naval Special Warfare. Yeah, thank you for bringing that up. Okay, so one of the big things I want everyone to know about today is we are going to spend some time talking about the SEAL Family Foundation. Uh, can you really quick, while we have everyone here at the beginning of the episode, and we'll and we'll bring it up a couple times during, but can you tell us just a little bit about your role with the SEAL Family Foundation before we get into you know your very illustrious career? By the way, many you know any one of your many achievements would probably define a career for most people, but you have probably about ten of those that we can go through. Um, can you so can you please just tell us a little about the SEAL Family Foundation, your role, and uh, how people can go check that out if they if they wish to? I'd be happy to. The SEAL Family Foundation, my my role within the foundation has evolved. Initially, it was someone who benefited from the kind of support that they offer, um, and now I have the opportunity, along with an amazing group of teammates, um, to include a Gold Star spouse, a Navy spouse whose husband worked in Naval Special Warfare, and other stalwarts and an amazing board across the country. Um, we work and are focused on really helping make the Naval Special Warfare families resilient. And I can define that in more detail, but the bottom line is the SEAL teams and the Special Warfare combatant craft crewmen community, what we call boat guys and team guys in the case of SEALs, really are of their greatest value to the Navy, to the special operations community and to the nation when they hit the six, eight, 10, 12 year mark. That's when people start pinning on, you know, E6 chief, senior chief, or lieutenant, lieutenant commander. They're not so much in the learning and getting mentored mode. They're now in the, the leading and delivering and fighting on behalf of the nation, bringing, you know, a decade or more of skills to bear on the battlefield. But guess what? You can't do that as people grow and move through their lives because what really entices someone to want to become a SEAL when they're a 22-year-old recent college graduate or an 18 or 19-year-old. They are all about becoming a team guy, a boat guy, serving the nation, becoming as competent as they can as a warfighter. But guess what? You're going to meet someone possibly when you're 26, 27, 28 years old, and you may decide that you want to get married and have a family. So today, the average SEAL, and this is somewhat dated, and I can't speak for the active duty community, but a few years ago, the average SEAL was 32 years old. He had two kids. He had a mortgage, a wife, and he also had his bachelor's degree. Um, so what that says is if you want to retain that 32-year-old who might have been serving in the teams for a decade, you've got to keep his family intact. You've got to support his family. And so that's what the SEAL Family Foundation is all about. And there's a whole range of things that we do uh, that really go from the very beginning of creating a family in a couple ways, creating an extended family, and then helping create an actual family. 
and it runs all the way out to bereavement. Um, we've said goodbye to some very noble seals just recently. I was very honored to be asked to be a pallbearer as we said goodbye to one of our first flag officers who was a Vietnam era seal. And uh, Seal Family Foundation was there to support that event and to help that family through that moment of saying goodbye. On the opposite end of the spectrum, unfortunately, we had a trainee, a very dedicated athlete, former Yale football player who was a young enlisted SEAL candidate who died following Hell Week. Um, and so in his instance, we were part of, of supporting and saying goodbye through that bereavement process. Um, those aren't the things that we, that we look forward to, but it's the support that we want to provide. More importantly, on the family side, and this is when I talk about my own evolution um, is that I've known young people who have become steals. I've had the opportunity to attend a graduation dinner. Well, I never heard of a graduation dinner. I went through class 137 back in 1986, where when you said to someone, hey, I think I want to be a seal, they would tell you, well, I heard there's going to be a new sea world opening, you know, in this area. <laughs> and, and you kind of shake your head and you have to explain it's not about protecting marine life it's about actually you know performing as a special operator today people know what seals are but the reality is at that point in time when you graduated from buds you would have family some who who chose to make the trip um, at your graduation today people recognize just what's involved in going through the training and the training is as hard as it's ever been and that's going back to world war ii korea vietnam the core of training the testing of one's metal remains the same. Parts of it have changed and become much more technical, but what the SEAL Family Foundation has done through a very generous donation, a targeted donation by a gentleman, I'll, I'll just say is Kevin, and we really appreciate what he has done. Um, we provide certain events that bring people together and start their Navy family and start their greater family. Kevin, pays for the Hell Week breakfast. Hell Week is grueling. And, and these trainees go through so much for their first several months of training. When they complete Hell Week, a week later, we bring them together for an event where they just they have a time to sit down, bring their spouse, fiance. Um, they're, they're in a moment of, of quiet celebration uh, before they bond further and move forward into the additional phases of training. The night before graduation, we host a graduation dinner. So if you've got you know, a son named Carl and he's been telling you the whole time about his buddy Hunter and his other buddy Vic, who are, man, we went through some amazing waves. It was terrifying. It was totally at night, but it clicked for us and we figured it out. Well, you get to meet who Carl's buddies are, right? But more importantly, it's the start of a extended family you now know who Carl's parents are or Carl's wife or girlfriend and Victor's wife and girlfriend. And, and you kind of start together in a social environment that continues to the, the graduation ceremony the next day. So if there's a deployment that happens where, where someone's injured or someone needs support, well, we've, we've been a catalyst in establishing kind of a family network early on and getting people to know each other and support each other. So those are just some of the things we do. We also offer um, a number of programs that we support, some we've incubated. There's a number out there for career transition that we were the initial funders of. So if you've heard of the Honor Foundation, that was funded um, and, and all the funding initially came for the first several years from the SEAL Family Foundation. Um, same with the SEAL Future Foundation. We funded that initially and got them going. Um, we're the primary funder for the sisterhood. Um, there's a program called Seal Kids, which is an amazing program. I'm meeting with their director later this week, who's a, uh, a PhD that really puts a lot of research and science and caring into the care of Seal Kids, both those who are the offspring of people serving, and also they, they work with those who are Gold Star family members. And we, in a way, in addition to the programs we fund on our own and create on our own, we also have been sort of a Silicon Valley incubator, a very targeted development of other 501c3 charities that help the, the SEAL community, the SWIC community, and all those enablers, including yourself, people who'd worked with Naval Special Warfare, uh, we make sure they and their families are supported. That's awesome. It's it's hard to express to uh 
to people um, listening how significant something like that is. Even after list, after uh, you described it very well, I still think people they don't they can't quite get it. But you know, I think one thing that uh, that it it, it uh, can maybe put into perspective is you know we we've uh, I remember when I was at the last command that I was with with NSW, uh, someone was killed downrange. And I know the SEAL Family Foundation provided a lot of support to the family. And, you know, when you talk about a, a community, like the Naval Special Warfare community, it is small. It is extremely small. Um, and then within that, all the people and their families all kind of spend all of their time together. Because when they're when everyone's at home, they're all hanging out together because they're friends as well as colleagues and teammates and their spouses become friends, and their kids become friends, and then when the service members leave, the families are left behind, but they don't just go, you know, be by themselves. A lot of times, they gather frequently, and, you know, they support each other at home, and that military family network, that unit, is capable of incredible things, and I've seen them rally around people in need uh, at at some of the worst moments of someone's life and provide crucial, critical support financially, emotionally, companionship, uh, emotional support, just a phone number that somebody can call and the seal family foundation dedicates themselves. And what's interesting is when I, when I look on LinkedIn or, or on, on, uh, I think on Facebook as well, I always see the SEAL Family Foundation posting congratulations to the graduates of SQT class or boat uh, class. We look forward to serving you and your families. And it's like right there from the immediate moment that somebody joins that community, the SEAL Family Foundation offers that support and it means a lot. And I appreciate you joining the team to continue to serve even after a 32 year career in the Navy. That's incredible. Well, it's, it's my pleasure. And, and really it's my extended family. It's, you know, an honor to go to these graduations. And I try to attend as many as I can, just because the pulse and the culture of the community is something I want to stay in touch with. And, and honestly, I'm honored to, to be around and be a part of helping to facilitate uh, that support. I, I will tell you, uh, we're not alone in this arena too. There's a whole network of 501c3s or nonprofit organizations that are out there supporting the Naval Special Warfare community. And we, we really mesh well together. We work in coordination. Some are now dedicated totally to uh, a SEAL or SWIC member who's leaving active service, going out to the civilian business community or technology community or law enforcement community. And there's others that have very specific missions that that differ from ours. And so we dovetail, I think, beautifully together and we work closely. What we really try to do within our pillars of support, which are the active duty SEALs, the active duty SWICs, their family members, and then the gold star family members, gold star spouses and the children of the fallen, what we also tend to, to really try to focus on is, is working directly with the command. So Naval Special Warfare Command will identify what might be something that is, is largely supported by the Navy, largely supported by DOD or the Special Operations Community, SOCOM, through their pressure on the force and family support. Um, but, but there are some gaps that we can help improve and we can help bring them along um, some real very new programs that we're trying to do and and also some programs that involve us looking back through history back through time to support those who served in places like Afghanistan and and those who perhaps are trying to start their own family but but they uh, don't know where to turn or or how to take some of those steps that involve uh, preparing them to do that in the future should something, on the battlefield or medically go wrong. So we have a new program called TADPOL, um, which is a service available to NSW members uh, should they choose to preserve their DNA to have a family in the future. Oh, wow. Um, so that's, that's pretty groundbreaking. And that's yeah. not currently offered by, by TRICARE Health Insurance or by the Navy, but, but we think it's a need. And we think it's a need that's been identified by our, our Gold Star spouse, Director of Programs, Cindy Axelson, who lost her husband in the events portrayed in the film Lone Survivor. Um, when you see a, a very well-known actor turn to, to Marks, Marks Luttrell, who is um, you know, the sole survivor and lone survivor, and say, hey, goodbye to Cindy for me. Um, 
you know, Mark Wahlberg, as Marcus turns back and says, no, you, you'll be able to do that. And he's like, no, man, I don't think I will tell Cindy I love her. Well, that's Cindy who works with us. And she's been amazing through her seven years, six, seven years with the organization. And she really is an incredible litmus test for what makes sense. Uh, we described the tadpole program to her and she, she thought there was a real valid need there, um, particularly as she talks to the other gold star spouses that she's close to. So as you can see, it's, it's kind of a mosaic of services we offer, but it's ones we're very proud of and ones that we stay very dedicated to constantly researching what else needs to be done, where we can assist, but always through and with the support and direction of the active duty command. Yeah. Now, you know, you didn't end up in this role by accident. You have quite a story, you know, and where does the story really begin for you? How do you end up in the Navy? How do you end up wanting to be a SEAL? You know, where does this whole, this whole journey that got you to where you are today start? You know, it's funny. I think for a lot of young people, young men and women want a mission, right? Want purpose. You'd hear that talked about a lot about a decade ago, right? That, that green is the new good or people want to you know, do things for others. Um, when I was a young person in high school, I knew I wanted to do something. And that continuum probably ran between Marine Corps and Peace Corps. I, I actually wanted to be in the special operations community. I just didn't really know it or I wanted to be a forest ranger. And so I looked hard at programs along both those two fronts. And in my mind, there was an amazing mentor and leader who uh, lived down the street and his name was uh, Colonel Pilatus and his kids went to high school with me. And at that time, he'd be gone for quite a while. Um, just like today's modern SEALs are gone 180 days uh, on average a year before they deploy. Mm -hmm. um, he was deploying for Vietnam. So I finished high school in 1976. And when I was a freshman and a sophomore, Vietnam was kind of winding down, but Colonel Palas would be gone. And when he'd come home, um, I'd spend time with his sons all the time and his daughter, but um, spent time with him and joined talking to him. And he was the first person I think I met when I was 14, who really talked to me like an adult, looked me in the eye, very clear thinker, um, listened to what I said, processed it and probably would follow on with a question or an insight or um, a suggestion. And he had told me about a program that at that time, the Marine Corps ran at Camp Pendleton. You had to be 15, 16 or 17. I was 14, about to turn 14, I guess. And it was called Devil Pups. So uh, he said, it's 10 days, you run around down at Camp Pendleton and you learn how to march and jump off a 35 foot pool. Uh, off a tower into a pool and do a million other things, very little sleep. And I thought, well, that sounds kind of interesting. So I, I was a devil pup. At that point in time, I thought the Marine Corps is, you know, it is what life is about as a person who wants to serve in the military. And so I applied for and received a Marine Corps ROTC scholarship when I went to college and was at the University of Southern California. And while I was there, I was a part of the Marine Corps unit and was on the drill team, which uh, was kind of like the Marine Corps 8th and I. Um, I was a 300 PF tier, which meant I maxed out the Marine Corps fitness test, which at that time was 20 pull-ups, 80 sit-ups under two minutes, and then you had to do a three-mile run under 18 minutes. So I was doing those things and um, did it repeatedly. Uh, felt that as I learned more, I wanted to be in the recon community. And so as a midshipman, whether you're at the Naval Academy or in an NROTC program at a civilian university, you go off on summer cruises. And the summer cruise I went on was a Mediterranean cruise aboard a helicopter carrier called the Iwo Jima. Mm. Um, and as you know, a lot of the amphib Navy, the ships are named after famous maritime battles that involved the Marine Corps and a lot of them were World War II amphibious campaigns. So while I was on the Iwo Jima, I was, this was my, in theory, indoctrination to learn what it's like to be a young enlisted sailor. Um, and then you, you do more Marine Corps things later on in your college career. So CrossFit wasn't a thing then, but I was in the hangar bay, that, that hangar deck below the flight deck where um, I was doing a rope climb. So I'd do a rope climb, look at my watch, wait 45 seconds, try to do another rope climb, wait a minute, do another rope climb, you know, wait a minute and a half. And was just kind of doing sort of uh, high intensity repeats. And this guy with long hair came up and he said, hey, for a swabby, you're in pretty good shape. 
And I kind of braced up. I said, oh, thank you, sir. Uh, I'm not a swabby. I'm a Marine option NROTC midshipman. He said, yeah, right. Um, listen, don't call <laughs> me, sir. And uh, if you like to work out, me and my buddies are going to be down here tomorrow morning. Why don't you join us? Uh, that'd be great. What, what time is that? Uh, we'll be here starting at 5 a.m. Be here early. 5 a.m. Uh, yes, sir. I'll think about it. He goes, yeah, you, you do think about it. Um, and don't call me, sir. So I headed down in the hangar bay the next morning at 5 a.m. And there's this circle of guys um, who have equally long hair and they're fit like nobody else I'd seen on this ship. And we start doing this PT circle. Now, in my mind, I'm this guy who maxed out the Marine Corps screening test and I thought I was in pretty good shape. And uh, I get out and work out with these guys and they're doing push ups and sets of 50 and they're doing six <laughs> push ups through the course of a 90 minute workout. They're doing back flutter kicks, which I didn't know what that was at the time. And, uh, you know, I tried to hang as best I could, but I, I wasn't keeping up with these guys. Um, when the workout ended, you know, they, no one came up and patted me on the back and they kind of looked over their shoulder at this kid and they all kind of went away. And the Lieutenant said, we're going to be doing this again tomorrow. If you want to, I said, yes, sir. He goes, Hey, don't call me, sir. Um, now I later learned he was a Lieutenant and, uh, I'm still in touch with him today, but I came back the next day and he said, you know what? You're the first one ever to come back twice. Um, cause midshipmen take their cruises in the summer. They've met many other midshipmen throughout the summer. So I worked out with the guys and then I, I wound up, you know, with so much lactic acid, I was, I was, you know, pretty, pretty slow and moving around for a few days, <laughs> but it was great. And I really enjoyed it. And I had a chance later to talk to him a little bit. And he explained, Hey, we're a UDT platoon. We're SEAL team members. We went to something called BUDS. I said, excuse me, to what? He said, BUDS. It's basic underwater demolition and SEAL training. I said, how do you do that? He goes, well, you know, I don't know. You got to talk to your folks at your college, but your Marine option. I said, yeah. He said, yeah, I don't know if it's possible. So I went back sat down with an amazing leader that we had, um, two of them, a Marine Corps gunnery sergeant and a Lieutenant Colonel Marine, who was the officer instructor for the NROTC unit there at USC. And back then they were trying to grow the Navy. So we had, I think about 220 midshipmen in that battalion. And I talked to the, the Lieutenant Colonel and I said, hey, sir, this is who I met. This is what I want to do. You know, I know last year we talked a little bit about force recon. Can you tell me more about it? And he was very frank and he said, hey, you know, the SEAL organization is an interesting one. Um, my guess is it's going to dwindle and shrink and perhaps disappear now that Vietnam is over. However, um, you may find, uh, you know, that there's a lasting career there. I will be honest with you about Force Recon. And this is dated, right? This is back in the yeah. late 1970s. At that point in time, he, he an accomplished infantry officer said, you'll do recon once. And it'll be two years. So if you want to play the commando role, that's not career enhancing. And, you know, if, if you get that shot, it'll be a one-time deal. So I thought about it, did more research, reached out through, uh, through some friends and found someone whose, whose son was a SEAL, an officer, and, and basically got some good information. So I chose to um, leave on, an, on a leave of absence from ROTC, evaluate this whole career opportunity about being a steel or do I go back and stay with the Marines and get commissioned there and the short answer is I was pretty torn um, everyone says no one makes it through buds and so I heard that a bunch and so for me um, I paid for school on my own I was working in the dorms as a what's called a resident advisor um, unbelievably good leadership training opportunity believe it or not probably one of the best ones I've had in my life Wow. Well, okay and after being uh, being an RA and at that time, no one had short hair and we were the university of Southern California. So all the now kind of historic cheesy TV shows were all being made in Southern California. So if you had short hair, you could work as an extra on a lot of these TV shows. So by doing that, I worked as an extra. Eventually I did some stunts, got my screen actors guild card. And then through the course of that paid my tuition, um, as an RA took care of my housing and then graduated college. I've got some older sisters who were at pretty liberal schools at that time, Berkeley and Stanford and UC Santa Barbara, Santa Clara. And I said, yeah, I still think I want to do the Marine Corps, you know, maybe the SEALs, but everyone says no one graduates. And they all looked at me and said, hey, we've known you all your life, much of our lives. And, and I'll tell you what, you just need adventure. Uh, huh, maybe they're right. So I thought about it. I applied for a work permit in New Zealand. At that time, there was a program among Commonwealth countries. You could work throughout the world in British Commonwealth nations like Australia, New Zealand, Canada, 
you know, the UK. So I chose New Zealand and uh, went there, worked for a year there and in Australia on a sheep shearing gang. And then as a concrete carpenter in the, in the Hunter Valley in New South Wales, came back with a lot more money than I left with and said, you know what? You've thought about this, but your degrees in finance, throw on your necktie. Let's, let's figure this out. You really ought to get serious and grow up. So at age 23, I went ahead and worked for what's now Morgan Stanley as a stockbroker. And man, it took about, took about 18 months of that. And I'm like, okay, I've got to go do the SEAL team. I've got to at least give it a shot. So I applied for officer candidate school, which is a different commissioning source to come in the Navy and um, went ahead, passed that to a standard that was acceptable at that point in time. Now it's, it's a whole lot harder to get a slot to go to officer candidate school, but I was fortunate, picked one up, got commissioned back in Newport, Rhode Island. My dad, who was a World War II veteran, um, never deployed during World War II, but joined as a 17 year old in the last few months of the war. And then he deployed during the Korean war as a surface warfare officer. He, he swore me in. So That's he awesome. made me an officer which was cool. And then, uh, and then I went off to buds class 137, graduated and then seal team one seal team five, and then, uh, the reserves for graduate school. You know, that's incredible. Uh, I wonder, do you ever wonder where your life would have been if that guy never approached you in the hangar bay? Yeah, that's a good, that's a good question to ponder. You know, I reached out to him years later, like I didn't talk to him for probably 30 years. And two years before my retirement, I reached out to invite three people to my retirement, three specific ones. Colonel Pilatus, um, who I had found out at that time was deceased, unfortunately. Mm -hmm. He died a couple years earlier. Um, also, uh, this gentleman, John Timmerman, was, was his name, uh, that lieutenant. And then there was also a gentleman, uh, Frank, who was another SEAL, who had actually served in the special operations community in Australia when their involvement in the Vietnam War ended, he emigrated to the U.S. to become a SEAL. Oh, he was wow. one of the other guys that we're working out with. So, so I am in touch with those guys. That doesn't answer the question, what would I done had he not come up and said hello? Um, it's a great question. I think I probably would have either gone into the Marine Corps or I'd have been some, you know, at that time, unhappy 35-year-old still, still serving as a stockbroker. Um, which I thought is a great career and it's perfect for the right person. Just wasn't well-timed for me at that young yeah. age. Yeah. It's uh, you never know. You never know where life's going to take you. It's such an interesting thing. So uh, I, another question I have is this is, um, you know, what was the at atmosphere like it, post Vietnam, uh, you know, maybe about less than a decade after Vietnam ends, what was the mood like if you said you wanted to join the military? Was it generally, I know your sister said you needed an adventure, but was there any pushback because of the PR crisis that the military maybe was going through post-Vietnam? Did you have any issues with that from your friends and family? No, I think, I think that's exactly right. I mean, I think people, you know, there was a sense of, uh, you know, the Vietnam conflict was protracted and costly and a lot of people's lives changed, both the Vietnamese folks and Americans and other, other partner nations who, who fought there. And it left a scar on a lot of people's lives, right? So I think part of the pushback was out of concern and, and uh, empathy. But there was a very negative feeling at that time attached to being in the military. Additionally, I think that when you mentioned you wanted to be in the military, there's a, there's one of my best friends in life is a stunt man, um, very successful stunt man who doubled John Claude Van Damme for a lot of his fight movies. If you ever saw the movie Roadhouse, which is oh, yeah. going to be a vintage film, but he doubled Patrick Swayze. So, you know, he does Patrick's Epic. fights and then, and then he dives on the motorcycle to peel the guy off. Um, well, you know, that guy out in front of my parents' home, we were good buddies. We did our first triathlon together. And, and he was really doing all the right things in the stunt arena. And I was doing the right things as a stockbroker. I was winning competitions, you know, for certain, certain sales quotas and things like that. But I wasn't digging it. And he knew that. And I said, hey, uh, Randy, got to tell you, man, um, I just joined the Navy. And he went, what? Why? Why would you do that? So it was super foreign to him and a guy who knew me well. He said, how much are you going to make in the Navy? I said, well, actually, 
It's about fifteen hundred a month. <laughs> I didn't think that was bad. This guy's in Hollywood as a Screen Actors Guild stuntman. He's like, I don't get that, dude. I don't know why you you do that. Um, on that note, though, for for any of your your folks who are watching. What stood out to me, my dad's deceased, but at the time I was pondering what I was going to do next, I shared with very, very, very few people that I was going in the military. And I shared with even fewer that I was attempting to enter the SEAL training pipeline or go to BUDS. And everyone offered opinion. They were all very quick to offer opinion. I mentioned my sisters, but other friends who, you know, I quit my job uh, when I got told, hey, yes, we got a slot for you in, in three months, that kind of thing. And it was an awkward conversation with just about everyone when I said, hey, I'm going to be taken off. Why? Well, I'm joining the Navy. Why? You know, and then they would tell me their opinion, their point of view. The only person who didn't was my dad. And so when I said to him, hey, dad, you, you know, everyone's telling me what I ought to do. You haven't said a word. And you're the one guy I know who served in the Navy. He goes, well, have you signed up? I said, I did. Yeah, yesterday. He said, okay, so now you've signed up. Yeah. And he told me, I think you'll never regret it. He said, wow. I just didn't want to influence you. It had to 100% be your decision. His circumstances were different from mine. Depression era kid, grew up without a dad. Um, you know, he joined the Navy as a 122 pound, five foot 11 guy. And he said his first full meal of his life was in the Navy. And he loved the Navy. The Navy sent him to Vanderbilt to get an electrical engineer. Uh, I can't even say it, let alone could I take a single basic electrical engineering course. Um, they sent him to Vanderbilt to get a degree in electrical engineering. They commissioned him during the Korean War. And in the Korean War, he got the GI Bill, came back, got his master's in double E from Stanford. So to him, the Navy, you know, brought him to my mom, built the family. It was everything to him. So anyway, he shared that with me only after I said, no, really, I want your opinion. So I'm very careful today when people ask me, hey, what do you think I should do? And I I give some advice that you know I could share with you if you want, but but a lot of it centers around don't ask too many people their opinion, you know, gather information, make your decision, but I don't uh, you know I don't oversell it. It's got to be something that's driven you know in here. After a little bit of this, you got to think about it, and know what you're getting into. Um, being angry at a girlfriend or having a boss who doesn't think you can hack it or wanting to show someone you know what you're really all about. Those aren't good reasons that'll ever get you through hell week, probably. Yeah. So, wow, that's, that is pretty awesome. Sounds like your dad had a lot of uh, wisdom to share there too, with that perspective. Um, so you join, so you join, you go to buds. Do you have any, uh, and you make it class one, three, seven, that was it one and done made it started with that class finished with that class. Yeah, I did. I was the one and done. I didn't know that was a thing back then, but I guess it is now. I mean, there's a good number of people. I couldn't give you the exact stat, but I would bet it's at least half who have rolled back once and, and or twice. Um, but I started, I think there were 110 and 137, 17 of us originals graduated together. Um, and at that point in time, you would, would graduate from BUDS and then you'd go to your SEAL team and you'd have a probationary period for up to a year. Uh, the earliest you could you could earn a trident would be six months after graduating from buds so um yeah i went went over to seal team one from there um in hell week i was not i was not an exemplary athlete compared to some of these guys college water polo players we had a guy who had done the iron man three times this is back in the you know early 80s and uh the iron man was was started in 1978 so it didn't really become a large event to later on and our leading petty officer lpo had done three ironman he's also one of the first guys to quit so oh, wow. you develop kind of an understanding of um a secret sauce that exists in terms of learning how to learn learning to be comfortable with discomfort learning to identify your own weakness you know recognize hey man i'm drifting i'm hallucinating um if i if i you know start to really if I fall out of the boat or I fall to the floor of the boat, you know, just be ready, help me out here. And, and then you're ready to watch your buddy who, dude, are you okay? You're kind of drifting right now. Let's, let's get back on it or, you know, swap roles or go to the difficult spot in the boat while your buddies have weaker moments. You learn self-awareness, you learn how to be a member of a team. And that's, that's something that 
impacts your life, not just in the SEAL teams, but obviously beyond. So you get, so you go through, rumor has it that that was the last hard class too. Is that true? Yeah, I think that's not a rumor. I'm just waiting for it to be officially certified. But I, I think it's pretty understood that 137 was, a, was the hardest class. <laughs> I say that. And, and now, you know, there, there have been some classes where no one finished. Very recently, some classes had very few finishers. Um, so, you know, lots of things have changed. But the core of that training uh, remains the same. It's a mentorship piece. Um, the person that's training you will quite often be someone you deploy later with in combat. There's a, a sense of mutual respect often built. Um, but that hell week component of staying awake for a week in a simulated combat environment, uh, that hasn't gone away. And there was pressure a number of years ago, particularly while we were fighting a desert war and a high altitude mountain war that that really addressed, there's a thing called the Quadrennial Defense Review, which now is more of a national military strategy overlook. But back in the day, the QDR was the responsibility of the various branches of the military to look hard at how they perform what their, what their role is in America's defense. And you kind of called yourself out. The Navy would, the Air Force would, the Army would, the Marine Corps, and everyone would come back with these reports that were generated that would then be blessed by the Secretary of Defense, and then the President would would give it the uh, the blessing and say, "Make it so." And in the case of Special Operations Forces, back in around 2005, 2006, the QDR said, "Hey, Iraq, Afghanistan are are driven by several different organizations in a perhaps disproportionate way, and soft is one of those components." There are what we call the soft truths special operations forces is soft and also too got to tell you i was just a quick departure i, I loved your interview with ben milligan and i've since Thank bought you. um by water beneath the walls it was a great interview and i was curious to see how many acronyms he used that didn't uh, get explained and there were very few mm -hmm. so he said he set the bar up here so if i fall into seal speak or acronym speak um, please stop me and ask me to clarify sure um you know, we, uh, that QDR, Quadrennial Defense Review, said that with Special Operations Forces, we in the SEAL teams, along with our partner forces in, you know, the Army Rangers, the Green Berets, the MARSOC Marines, all these different communities, the Air Force PJs, had to grow by 15%. So at that time, there were approximately 1,700 enlisted SEALs and probably about 400 SEAL officers, but heavily tapped, heavily used constant deployments. And so with the notion that we grow by 15%, that was translated into a growth of about 500 new SEALs. And so uh, new enlisted SEALs. So year one of that growth, I was placed in charge of really kind of a human capital enterprise to find, identify the traits, find talented candidates and try to improve who we had coming into the pipeline and their success of getting through without degrading training in any way. And so the first year, I think 2000, 2006 was probably the first year of that effort. And we said, okay, got some good news. 136 people graduated from SEAL training, outstanding. But guess what? Um, following the, the semicolon comes, hey, we lost a number in combat. We had many retire. We had some who chose to do their six year obligation and get out. And so we lost 135 SEALs when we grew 136 new ones. Net, net, year one of a presidential mandate to grow 500 new SEALs, we were up one SEAL. So we had to kind of redouble our efforts, really think hard about who we are, where we come from, what are the success traits. And we did a very thorough internal look. And through the course of that look, we learned some pretty interesting things. Um, some of which I think applies beautifully today when employers are having a hard time finding candidates for their particular industries, right? Um, I mean, everything from Uber to the tech world to law enforcement, there's, there's a real shortage of, of workers that's impacting people's lives with shortened hours and, and other things. And what we learned at that time in identifying talent is there's certain traits that, um, that you have to look for that really become a part of character. There's things you can train to 
and those things that you can train to, which include some combat skills, um, you know, those you can teach someone, but the character part, you can. Um, and what we did was we looked hard internally at what makes a successful SEAL and, and where in that pipeline, that, you know, that one year continuum that starts with first phase buds, second phase buds, um, second phase is all hell week finishers. Um, that's the dive phase of training, third phase of buds, which is the land warfare training. That's where we now have the core of solid people. Their metal's been tested. They're stepping out there as a team member. They're ready to go. That's when we invest in technology and weapons training and demolition and so forth. And then from there, they move into what's called SEAL qualification training or SQT. So when someone is a newly minted SEAL, we talk about going to their SQT graduation. So we looked at the folks about six weeks in who are Hell Week graduates, and we call them high potential candidates. Because when someone makes it through Hell Week, they have on average about a 94 to 96% likelihood of coming all the way out the other end of the pipeline as a SEAL and going and serving in the SEAL teams. So we looked at what those traits are of that young person. Everything from at what age did you decide you wanted to do work like this to what do your family members do? What sports did you play? Um, were you a Boy Scout? If so, were you an Eagle Scout? Um, and, and a range of other things. Do you find history interesting? Um, and, then, and then there's also some psychological tests that try to identify resilience. Um, and, and it was kind of funny. We looked at all kinds of geography as well. And um, a couple of the core things that came away, some which were pretty surprising, um, the, the sports that are most often represented by SEALs. If you ask the average SEAL, what sports did you play? There's a large number that played football, basketball, baseball. But those three sports have about the lowest prediction of success. Mm. So, you know, granted, vast numbers of American athletes play those sports. But when you start looking at how to build a highly efficient, high ROI human capital enterprise, you, you pull a couple layers back off that onion and you start to see 11 core sports. And they include things like ice hockey, wrestling, lacrosse, uh, water polo, um, swimming, cross country running. And what, what some people sometimes look at is, yeah, but, but who plays those sports? Well, a lot of people do. And, and as we looked to grow the SEAL teams, we shifted a lot of our resources from supporting NFL events or going to NASCAR events to be a part of a, uh, a patriotic celebration at a race to taking those same supporting folks, those, those few SEALs, a precious resource, those few SEALs who are on shore duty. And we started having them go out to the National Wrestling Tournament, or we would have them go to, you know, here in Coronado, California, which is a water polo factory, we bring 632 water polo players around the country together here for a competition. Well, we'd bring some SEALs out with a water polo and aquatics background and, and talk to some of these young folks. And a large number of them um, went on to become SEALs. In fact, the local high school here, I think, had a run of 28 water polo players who came in the Navy to be a SEAL uh, and none of whom had quit. I think we've had a couple who haven't since that time that's a pretty amazing run for, for a pretty small town. Yeah. So, you uh, know, Oh, sorry. Um, go ahead. Do you want to finish that thought? No. So the last thing that we, that, that might relate to people is we, we really looked at character as a key element. We looked at mindset. We really had to institutionalize our mentoring. Um, and then really when you look at the far end of it and it brings us back to where we are today, it's also military members who want to know their families are taken care of before they can decide to stay. Yeah. And that's where the SEAL Family Foundation piece makes me feel fulfilled in what I do currently. Yeah. So that, I'm actually glad you said that last bit because, uh, I, I, well, I'm, I'm looking at the chat here too. And I just want to let you know, uh, Tony Waters is watching. He wanted to let you know that, in fact, class 177 was the hardest class. Um, just wanted to give you an update. Oh, there. Is that, so they're, no, they're now <laughs> certified. Yeah, that's what he, that well, that's what he says. That's, that's, that's what his comment says. That might have happened during the course of this because i just went to wikipedia before we did our interview so it might have happened in the last few minutes so yeah. it's 177 yeah i will i will make sure i share that word yeah <laughs> thank you tony <laughs> um and thanks for watching tony and, and you said uh you, you had talked about in instituting in, institutionalizing mentorship the, and and the navy really 
you know, adopted that policy too. I remember being in the Navy when it became mandatory that you had to have a mentor defined in your DIVO record, your division officer record. Uh, every sailor had to have a mentor. When you joined and you get to the, to the teams, you went to a SEAL team after, you know, you finish your training. Did you have a mentor? Who, who brought you up as a JO in the SEAL teams? Yeah, that's a great question. I mean, every JO in any part of the Navy, I, I believe, but certainly in the SEAL team is, is really raised and, and, and educated and gets their, their understanding of things by their senior enlisted. So in my case, it was a, uh, a twin pin, um, a SEAL who had both his EOD crab and his SEAL trident. Um, he's also a SEAL who had gone to Ranger School uh, he was an African-American SEAL before there were a lot of African-Americans. His first name was Les. I don't know if he'd be comfortable with me sharing sure. his last name because sure. he served in a number of roles and, and continues to today. But uh, he was an amazing mentor. Um, I also had another mentor, Master Chief Mike Fackety in a platoon. And um, uh, Mike got injured, left that platoon. But just, just really talented people who I hope it continues today. You know, the notion when you walk into a platoon as an officer, you're sitting there looking around going, OK, this is a this is a pretty hardcore, salty, accomplished crew around me. And I'm a college grad who just went through this, you know, this buds thing. I'm going to lead these guys. But the culture is one where you serve as an assistant platoon commander. You might have some disassociated tours and there's a method to the madness that that does bring you along. But you have to trust your LPO and your chief. Um, and you have to be self-aware and know when, you know, humility pays off, but you also need to know when to lead. And, you know, I'm speaking more for a time when I was in platoons um, and, it, and it has probably evolved a little bit these days. But back in the day and what I personally experienced for me was I had uh, two, two amazing chiefs, uh, members of the Goat Locker, senior chief, first name Les, and then Mike, um, who really brought me along. That's awesome. I think that's, you know, a great answer as a sign of respect to the position that you're in as a J.O., right? Because you you can't not do anything because you're supposed to be in charge and you're never going to earn respect if you just, you know, if you're if you're submissive or or, uh, or or too introverted. But also you need to know that, you know, this is something that I heard when working with the Army doing uh, detainee ops deployment was – in, in many ways, experience leads, you know, and, and if somebody's done this time and time again, their knowledge is valid. They have a lot that they can share. And, you know, hearing that, being willing to hear that and collect as much different points of view and perspectives as possible to then make better leadership decisions and de develop yourself as a person uh, is, is a, a great skill. Listening, you know, following first is, is a great leadership quality, you know, or knowing when to follow, knowing when to lead. Would you say that that, you know, continued throughout your career as a as that kind of attitude that you brought as you made it you you retired as a captain in 06. There's only four ranks above that in the that exist in the military. You know, how did that attitude kind of serve you throughout your career? I think it did. I think I also learned through observation. Uh, we had a commander at the time of 9/11. I was working at the headquarters, and we had uh, Rear Admiral. Excuse me. Yeah, at that time, Rear Admiral Eric Olson, who later went on to be a four star in command SOCOM. But you would be in a staff meeting with a bunch of O5s, O6s, some master chiefs, and some civilian, senior civilian personnel who were subject matter experts. And there'd be this great debate going on over any one of a number of topics. And I don't say this is everyone, but in the case of Admiral Olson, all the conversation would be done. And then he has this ability. He's, he's, um, he's a very confident leader, but he's a quiet individual, if that makes sense. And so at the end of all this debate, he would sort of summarize, he'd take it all in and summarize in about two sentences or maybe 14 words, everything important that was discussed along with giving us direction on what his intent was. Um, and so you see a guy like that and you think there's, there's a lot to learn there and you try to emulate him. Um, I used to fill in uh, during that 10 day, 10 year period where I was a reservist, I would go over downrange as a troop commander. So it'd be all active duty, uh, you know, two platoons of active duty SEALs. And I was the troop commander for these two platoons going to exercises in Africa. 
I did that a number of times. Um, and I'd also fill in as the XO of SEAL Team 3. So through those experiences, um, I got to know um, a number of, of very great and successful officers, and Bill McRaven was one of them. And I kind of observed his style. Um, I also observed later after serving with him when he was a CO of SEAL Team 3, and I would kind of fill in as his XO when his actual XOs would head off to a board or, or go off somewhere for, for some assignment. Um, I would fill in and cover that role as executive officer. And when he was later Commodore Group 1, um, that whole notion of family, and I'm not trying to beat this theme to death, but the Commodore who was developing amazing new technologies, developing the template for deploying the 06 Troop Commander downrange, um, who later led JSOC and was the leader uh, of the Osama bin Laden takedown. Um, when he was Commodore Group 1, we had family days or seal pup days. He was out there running around wearing a pair of swim fins with a with a mask and you know letting little kids throw water balloons at him, um, which was spoke to his understanding of how important the family element was. Spoke to his humility. Um, but then the guy would go out later and and crush it in terms of what he was developing for SEAL Team. Or if you read his book Spec Ops, you know obviously an intellectual who really studies the the art of um, you know, commando warfare. I have not read so, that, but that's going on the list. It's a great book. It's a number. He wrote it actually while he was a graduate student at the Naval Postgrad School in Monterey, and his thesis became uh, became a book. He's written a number of other books, um, but but this one talks about not just the United States small unit tactics, but the Italians who are some of the most accomplished um, combat swimmers, and and what the you know, other forces throughout millennia and throughout the world or across the globe um, have done and what we've learned from them. I know um, one thing that people, you know, you were talking about the um, increasing the force. And one thing that people might be interested to know about you, uh, if you if you have a couple things about it you would like to share, is your work on two significant projects for the Navy. Uh, one or it ended up being at least uh, one is the film Navy Seals with Charlie Sheen, and the other is uh, Act of Valor. And can you talk a little bit about how those things came to be and what your role was with them? Um, sure. So let's start with Navy Seals first, if that's okay. Yeah, I mean it's um, legendary, one of the best Navy movies ever made. Well, and it's one of those things too where if we could just couch the whole film thing when you talk to people like former Vice Admiral Joe McGuire, who saw the Richard Widmark film, The Frogman, and that was an impetus for his joining the military. You talk to Admiral McRaven and he will tell you um, where he got the core or the kernel of the idea to become a SEAL was from watching John, John Wayne in the Green Berets. When you talk to Ed Byers, a SEAL Medal of Honor winner, who, who I've had the pleasure to meet uh, a number of times, and he tells you, hey, I saw the movie Navy Seals, and that's what put the idea in my mind. You know, he grew up on a farm and was very distant from all those things. You know, he wasn't in a small town that is a water polo factory that, you know, you're three steps away from becoming a lifeguard and then becoming a, a bud student. He grew up pretty far away from all of that in small town America. And the movie Navy Seals is what put him on a path to explore and then pursue that, that career field. And then he won uh, while working with Naval Special Warfare Development Group. Uh, he was the recipient of the Medal of Honor for his work mm -hmm. um, in, in, a, in a very, very celebrated rescue. Um, so, so that said, that's kind of the nature of the film thing. Now, with Navy SEALs, I was getting out off active duty. At that point in time, there was no GI Bill like there is today. So they had a thing called Veep, which sounds like a noise your, you know, your laptop might make after you drop it. But in reality... <laughs> It was a very poorly designed um, skin flint college program. So for Veep, you had to put in, um, basically you had to put in $2,700. And once you put in your $2,700, the military or DOD would add twice that amount, another 5,400 for a total of whatever that is, 8,100 bucks. So your entire college was paid for as long as it cost less than 8,100 bucks. I was going to UCLA um and attending there to get my master's and what i found was in a two-year program 
you only get paid for those months where there's actually school. Additionally, um, it was your 2700 that came out first. So my 2700 disappeared probably at about month 18. And I think I got about, you know, $600 of, of DOD money. So um, as I was getting ready to go to grad school, um, I heard they were making this movie called Navy Seals. It was written by a former dev crew guy, Chuck Farr, and funny guy. And, and he'd spent time in the teams doing some noble things, notable things. And um, so already having been a stunt player on a small scale, not a lot of things, but I'd been a stunt man, had my SAG card. And a buddy from SEAL Team 5 who had just gotten out and I um, reached out to the stunt coordinator. He said, yeah, well, we're interested in coming up. But, you know, the impression, the talk on the street was they were looking for guys who had all this combat experience and almost no SEALs did back then. It was very, very rare. Um, probably more was seen to dev grew at that time than anywhere else, but not many people had seen much outside of Grenada and a few isolated incidents. So in meeting with them, I, I said, look, hey, you know, if this, if this makes sense for you, if you're looking for a Vietnam, you know, seal who swam up river at night with a knife in his teeth and stuck behind enemy lines, that's not me. If you're looking for a guy who is a training officer to seal team or in a, in a platoon Tuesday, I'm your guy. And, uh, met with the, the stunt coordinator, <laughs> an amazing guy, um, Bud Davis, who's still an icon. He and Gene LaBelle are, are some of the most notable stunt coordinators in Hollywood. Um, he and the director, we, my buddy and I drove back. And back then there were no cell phones that had voice message capability. You had this thing about the size of a suitcase that had cassette tapes called an answering machine <laughs> and got back. My answering machine had a message said, Hey, can you guys move to Virginia beach for filming in August and then Spain for two months after that? And so I delayed grad school for a year um, because this was a chance to pay for grad school. And in so doing, the film had limited support from the military, meaning the military read the script, the, the public affairs folks, command folks had said, you know, there's nothing here objectionable to my recollection, uh, but we're not supporting it. We're not providing you boats and guys and all that stuff. So there were seven or eight SEALs, um, four from the East Coast, three or four from the West Coast. And we each doubled one of the actors. So the actor I doubled for all the SEAL stuff was Charlie Sheen. I didn't, I didn't do the, uh, the bridge jump. That was his personal stunt guy, um, an accomplished stunt man named Eddie Braun. And he was also the driver, um, but Eddie wasn't cut out for the SEAL stuff. And so swimming out of submarines, jumping out of helicopters, uh, the underwater knife fight at the end of the movie, um, that, was, that was me as Charlie. Um, and doubled one of the other actors who, who played a, a point man. So, so that film was made back in the day, um, based more on an East Coast team. And it, it held up fairly well. There's some things that I think all of us were probably a little frustrated by. Um, the actors became kind of the script writers, things that we thought should have been more accurate, ne weren't necessarily. Um, but we were being, you know, paid to do the kind of dangerous stuff. And the film was what the film was. And I think at the end of the day, it was, it was pretty entertaining and gave a window on the seals. Um, some elements of it, I think there are four themes when we got, and I was in a producer role for the Navy, the lead producer for the Navy on Active Valor. And there's four themes that we really wanted to stress that were not stressed heavily in Navy seals. And, and one of those, quite honestly, was the notion of, the SEAL platoon is having to gather all their own intelligence and their, their own supply clerks and their, their own everything. And the reality is SEAL team is, the SEAL teams are a part of the Navy and they're one of four warfare communities within the Navy and the Navy is a part of DOD. And, you know, when we later made active valor, we wanted to stress that Marines are partners and the air force capability is a partner force. And, the Navy works with EOD as an integral component and all the enablers, yourself included, Max, who, who are the people who make missions happen. So we tried to hit that as a theme. But just with Navy SEALs, it was, it was a great experience. It paid for grad school. Um, and it was, uh, you know, I, I think at the end of the day, it's a film that held up over time. Yeah. You know, I, I, I watched the whole thing yesterday. Uh, it'd been a, it's been a few yeah. years. It's been a few years since I've seen it. And I wanted to have it fresh in my mind. And, you know, it's interesting because watching it now uh, and, and talking to you about it, first of all, 
totally badass that you got to do that. Um, really amazing. The, I think that they're like, you know, a lot of hip firing going on. I think even the sniper, uh, yeah, like yeah. fire from every shot from the hip <laughs> almost. Uh, and it was, it yeah. was, it was, uh, so, uh, you know, you could, when, when I watch a military movie, I try to, uh, forget that I was ever in the military and not nitpick because, you know, I know everyone's doing their best to balance the military history versus making this appealing for the masses. And this is coming off the heels of commando and predator and Arnold running around with a mini gun all everywhere. And so yeah. anyway, what I was getting at was on the flip side of that, I'm watching this movie and I'm kind of just going through things like, okay, we've got, you know, STV scenes, we've got halo jumps, we've got uh, aircraft carrier, we've got, um, uh, we've got um, it, intel gathering, uh, recruiting sources, we've got uh, a snatch and grab, we've got all like a ton, like it really actual and we've got guys having fun on the golf course you know and drinking uh we yeah. have the emotion a funeral it actually kind of was great you know like it really was when i look at it when, and i and i always knew it was an awesome movie but i never really looked at it and said well does this hit the seal mission how well does it hit like the seal mission and it kind of really nails it in a lot of ways i, I think it was almost prescient if i'm using that that word correctly. I mean, it almost foretold the future in a lot of ways. I mean, there were some flaws and, um, you know, no one, no one would drink water. Um, Hey, guess what? I don't care how tough you are. You're drinking water on an extended mission. No one was ever seen eating food. Um, every, every, every round that was fired was from the hip and it was into a hail of enemy bullets coming at, at the seals in the movie and none of them got hit or rarely got hit. So there were some elements of it that we got probably too hung up on as, as tech advisors. Um, it was, it was funny in that I'd mentioned my dad earlier. So I saw the movie with my dad when it came out, I think I, I think I saw a premiere and then I, I took him to see it and I would say, you know, dad, that's, that doesn't make sense. You'd have to, there's no way you would go with that kind of sustained fire without changing magazines. You'd need many magazines to do that. You'd be, and he'd go, uh-huh. And I'd say <laughs> another scene. And I'd tell him, you know, dad, that wouldn't have happened because if you jump into dark water, like that bridge jump, when we go into water that we don't know what it is, you know, we go feet first and you, you kind of protect your body. And, and he, uh-huh. <laughs> and we came out of the movie and he said, I am never, watching another war movie with, with you. <laughs> so I learned a little bit from that. Uh, but, but there were some, some good elements to it. Uh, you mentioned the golf scene. That was, that was very genuine. Um, that was, you work, when, when you work on a film like that, and today the film industry has evolved. I have not been involved with it for a while, but um, you know, you work six days a week, you're on a weekly check as a stunt player, or as an actor, and all those guys would work their contracts however they worked them, but you work hard. And so we had one day off and the guy said, let's go golfing. And, uh, and that was very organic. We all went golfing. Uh, there were some beers involved and, uh, and Bill Paxton, you know, rest in peace, who played the sniper, uh, Bill said, Hey, and he was at that point, he'd never directed anything. And this was his opportunity. He pitched to, to the film's director, the notion of, a second unit to do the scene that you saw at the golf course. And it basically recreated what we'd done on our day off on a Sunday. Oh, that's awesome. um, I don't think we damaged the course quite the way they did in the, the scene that was filmed. Um, we PT'd with the actors. We showed up the first day and uh, it was kind of funny because they were telling us as we were getting ready, you know, got three months, just so you know, these actors were hand selected. These people have had personal trainers some of the best diving coaches in the world working with them, you know, two, three times a week, the production company has been paying for it. Stand by. We were kind of all old guys, right? We were the youngest guy was probably 29 and most of us were 32, 30, 33. So first day we get out there, there's a two week training segment, kind of like how Dale Dye will take people for platoon or saving private Ryan and run kind of a boot camp and sort of a military appreciation thing. We did something like that, and it included a PT circle, a physical training circle, kind of like what you do at a SEAL team. And uh, first day, all the actors are there, and we're like, man, these kids are going to be tough as anything. And, and a couple of them were. Dennis Haysbert, tough as nails. Rick Rosovich, tough as nails. A lot of these guys were really, had a lot of heart and had trained, and, and were getting after it. Haysbert, who's the, the, uh, 
uh, all state insurance guy and he, he oh, yeah. was in the unit a number of other shows mm -hmm. he played the chief in the yeah. movie yeah. which yeah. to me i actually got him together with with less who is my platoon chief um to talk about the concept of being an african-american in a largely you know uh, a pretty much coastal um kind of people from washington oregon california and then a few places in the midwest and then kind of connecticut new jersey and in florida texas thing you know what's it like to be a, a black seal leader and so there was some good mentoring that went on there between dennis haysbert and my first platoon chief less um so as we're pt and that's day one we got all these guys and some were hanging but we soon realized yeah we we kind of got this down the next day it went from seven actors to about five actors but you know all <laughs> all eight of us were there the third day, it was, it was, I think it was either Cyril O'Reilly or Dennis Haysbert who showed up and it was just us. So we're like, okay, we see how that's going to go. Um, so it's pretty, pretty funny, but they had good heart. They really wanted to learn what we were all about. Um, and a couple of these guys, I mean, later, uh, Haysbert, Rick Rosvich in particular, Rick Rosvich, just a beast. Uh, he played community college football, but he, uh, yeah, he was, he was pretty tough dude. Um, so, and all of them wanted to learn more about you know, the, the community to accurately as best we could, you know, gain information to portray the SEAL teams well. They didn't always, uh, sometimes they lost out when we'd say, hey man, put weight in your pack. Viewers know, we all watch military movies. We can tell when it's a pillow or a chunk of foam, yeah. put weight in your pack. We lost those battles, but uh, but others we won. That's awesome, It, it it's great. Um, I, it's actually that is a really p good piece of uh, history there about uh, the chief in the film and um, your your senior chief Les. I, I didn't. It's interesting to note that that level of thoughtfulness was put into that. Uh, I I think people will really enjoy knowing that. That's that's really cool. Um, that you were considering those types of things back then. You know, a lot of people would have wouldn't really uh, think about that period of time because the movie came out in 1990. I think theatrical theatrical release and consider that people were actually, you know, having those conversations back then, thinking about those kinds of things, putting that kind of consideration into the representation in the film. So that's awesome. Um, and then while you were working on the uh, at, uh, Naval Special Warfare, uh, it, working on this manpower issue, how did Act of Valor come to be? Which I think is an, another awesome movie. Yeah. Well, that there were a couple of things about Act of Valor. We, um, when we realized how much of a shortfall we had in SEAL Manning at the height of the global war on terror, or what later was referred to as just the war on terror, um, but largely Iraq, Afghanistan, the Philippines, and then also maintaining a presence with our partner forces throughout Asia and Latin America and Africa. Um, you know, there was a lot of work and we needed people desperately. And so the challenge was so great um, particularly after year one of our five-year plan, we were up one guy, 499 to get in four years. We, we said, okay, let's, we've done this study. We had to file for what's called a, a, a UFER, an unfunded oh, request. Oh, yep, yep, yep. To do a, a really in-depth, thorough marketing research. Actually, it was the Gallup folks who, who we hired to help us do that. Um, we identified those traits. And then we also thought, okay, what can we do that, that let's pull every lever we can. And so we don't know really which ones made the ultimate difference. All we know is that, um, you know, we, we did about six things. One of which was we developed a mentor network because we found that if someone knew a SEAL, didn't need to be a brother or a dad or an next door neighbor, but if you knew a SEAL, the odds of you completing training were about 60% higher. So we developed a mentor network of former SEALs and SWICs across the country um, 26 different recruiting districts in the Navy. There were 26 individuals serving in those. Um, we also created a financial incentive for the completion of, of Hell Week. Pretty much universally, as we look back, that $40,000 or $48,000 probably had very little impact. 18-year-olds, 22-year-olds are driven by mission accomplishment. They're not driven by, man, I'd buy a Lexus, a Lexus or a a Raptor if I had 48,000 bucks in my pocket. So we, we did that though, financial incentive. We also created a SEAL specific company within boot camp up at Great Lakes um, in, in Illinois. Um, that probably had some impact. 
uh, we created a BUDS prep. So after you finish boot camp, but before you came to basic underwater demo, demolition seal training, you'd have to uh, go through this kind of training course. Because you basically, and as you know, Max, from your experience, the opportunity to work out in Navy boot camp and the food, while high quality, is probably not in volume sufficient to sustain a guy who's burning 4,500 calories a day training, right? Yeah. So Bud's Prep kind of got around that. And we did some other things. So can I just, can I just those- really, I don't want to interrupt you, but for, I know for people listening might want to know this when you yeah. talk about the food in Navy boot camp. I have to add too, for what it's worth, and a startling amount of access to like cake, uh, donuts, muffins, things that are downright not good for you. When you hit the chow line at uh, Navy boot camp, you can grab those things too. There's no incentive or, or to, to choose or not to choose those items. So it still remains up to the individual. They could make it what, you know, what it is. And then you're, you eat at very specific times, not like, Hey, I just finished a workout. I could really, you know, use these nutrients right now. That's not really an option either. No, that's a good point. I mean, I think the quality of food at boot camp you lived it. I didn't, I visited it. So I have a feeling that when I would come through with an admiral and a couple master chiefs and another captain, the food quality may or may not have been representative yeah. that day as yeah. to every meal, yeah. but, um, but there was, <laughs> yeah, there was the responsibility of personal, personal, uh, selection in what you ate. And you're right. If a kid gravitated towards, you know, some, some food subjects or objects than others, um, yeah, you could, uh, it's not optimal. No, no trained, um, yeah, no, no athlete triathletes going to seek those exact foods, uh, food items you mentioned. Yeah. Um, but overall, the quality, I guess, is decent, but the the training and the opportunity to improve it through Bud's Prep was there. So we had never finished, um, never had a full Bud's class going back to World War II, Korea, Vietnam, ever. The first full class. In fact, when we were at our low point in 2006, 2005, 2006, they actually wanted to remove the notion of real cold water immersion from training because it was thought that perhaps that's um, reducing our numbers. And so um, no class started between say October and March to move away from those coldest times a year for a hell week to take place. And they dropped to just four classes a year. So through the efforts that we described and through a marketing campaign that included things like reaching out to uh, to the Ironman organizers and, and talking to the race director there who we have a relationship with her and with, with the NBC folks. Um, we had SEALs attend the Ironman, parachute into the water at the start. And then later, in fact, one of our, uh, one of our admirals, uh, Keith Davids, along with another SEAL, David Goggins, some of your folks may know him, um, they parachuted. I was the third guy uh, wearing the helmet camera, but they parachuted, hit the water, and then did the Iron Man. And in classic SEAL uh, tradition, they crossed the finish line high fiving in a in a pretty competitive time. So um, you know those kind of opportunities were things that we used to educate people about the opportunity to become a SEAL. Um, and as it went on we realized we did started doing a series called life after the seal teams. And we talked to people like, um, uh, you know, a number of folks from all kinds of different walks, Michael Crook, who was an enlisted seal who later went on to be the president of, um, companies ranging from Pearl Izumi cycle gear to, to Kelty backpacking equipment to Patagonia. Um, Michael then earned his PhD. He's now a professor up in Oregon. Uh, he'd been a professor at Pepperdine. Um, we interviewed Michael. What did you learn in the SEAL teams that made you so successful today? He's a venture capital partner with uh, with one of the original founders of AOL. Um, and, he, and he would describe that. Um, so we recognized you had to get the word out there. We wanted to make it credible. We developed an app so that people could take the SEAL screening test. We developed the SEAL screening test as its own athletic event and had the Navy SEAL challenge that traveled across the country. And so people could take it in kind of a sports festival manner and see where they stack up. So it was partly education. Um, Active Valor was born out of the notion of um, let's look towards granting access to a film production company that we would allow the opportunity to compete for that project, um, 
that would be handled by the Navy's public affairs arena. People would submit to the PAO folks um, a panel who would address and, and evaluate each of those proposals. The proposal at one was Act of Valor, which was directed by Scott Waugh. Scott Waugh had been a stuntman, past president of uh, Stunts Unlimited. Um, his, his father had actually played Spider-Man, was a stunt player for Spider-Man. Oh, his no. brother's a noted director as well. So Scott Waugh, Mouse McCoy, uh, another stunt player, a motorcycle guy came in and they, that was their first, you know, their directorial debut. And um, I worked closely with them. We kind of partnered. We, the Navy, granted access on a not to interfere basis. Uh, they had to, to collect their funding to make the film. So it's a really unique partnership. Um, it was done legally, legitimately. Uh, the SEALs were not paid. Everyone there, it was an ancillary duty to what their regular job was. And through the course of what was about a year, um, you know, the, the, I provided them with about 35 SEALs who were on shore duty who said they'd be willing to um, you know, share their insight to better develop the script. And in the course of interviewing those 35 guys who you know, were not going through you know, didn't have DUIs or any kind of uh, impending legal action or anything like that. Um, through those 35 interviews, they said, hey, here are, the, here are the nine that we really think are the core of this that we'd like to build this film around. And you know, that was awesome. They chose. We wanted to give, we had veto power, but we wanted their artistic, their artistic insight. We didn't want to you know, direct the film by proxy. It was theirs to build. Um, we wrote on the roof of my house, um, along with one of the screenwriters from 300, um, a good friend of mine at, uh, who, who was the SEAL, Tom Brown, myself, Scott Waugh, Malcolm McCoy, really kind of sketched out the themes for what the film was. And then um, they went ahead, Kurt Johnstad went ahead and built that into an actual script. Um, and those four themes that we really mandated, you tell us the story how you want, but the story needs to include it's a team of teams, right? We talked earlier about Navy SEALs, how every component from intel gathering to everything else was the SEALs doing it for themselves. Well, that's not accurate. So let's make it accurate. Let's fly on Air Force birds with Navy helicopters supporting, with Marines in, in support, and EOD and Air Force combat controllers. Um, the second theme was we wanted to honor the fallen. We wanted to honor our brothers. We wanted this to be something that was accurate. And so four or five of the major themes of the movie were ones that I chose. I said, this is important. You can say Duncan doesn't, doesn't, they always call me captain, but the point is, you know, hey, say Duncan, this doesn't fit with what we're trying to do, but these are important stories that are accurate. I wanted everything to be off the battlefield. We didn't want it to be, and they, they really drove this, didn't want it to be in the desert um, or in Afghanistan, right? Because that had, had really proven to be sort of, uh, box office poison at that time. Um, a lot of films about those, those battles really didn't do well. And these guys were in business, but they're also very honorable. They wanted to tell our story right. Um, another theme was diversity. Um, and again, not diversity of forces. We talked about that, the team of teams concept, but this diversity is, um, and as you saw, probably the most challenging underwater work in any branch of the military that you can do, and, and you referenced it earlier, is locking out of a submarine for a seven, eight hour, you know, 10 hour uh, time underwater, breathing either boat air or off a dragger device, um, and locking out and getting into a sealed delivery vehicle, a mini submarine, being wet and submerged that entire time. A lot of people think you got to be a Laguna Beach water polo player to have that kind of competency or uh, a Jersey Shore lifeguard. But the reality is we had a, uh, a Hispanic SEAL who grew up in East LA um, and an African-American SEAL uh, from the East Coast who actually was a, a runway model. AJ was a runway model before joining the SEAL teams as like a 31-year-old, uh, just an aberrant human being in terms of his physicality. Um, so those two were the two folks that were the SDV uh, pilot and navigator for that scene. Um, I had the pleasure of being underwater. I was, I was one of two primary underwater videographers for the film throughout all the submarine scenes and diving scenes. And um, I always will appreciate Senior Chief Andy, uh, Andy McCaskill, who kind of mentored me on becoming a better, better cameraman, particularly into the underwater side. And I had fun shooting the aerials and that kind of thing. So... So we wanted to make that theme of diversity important. And then the fourth 
is evidenced very early on in the film and then later in the film, which is family, right? So you see the beach scene, the platoon gets together. That was the hardest part of the film to, to get approval for because it was on a beach on Navy property. And you know all the live fire stuff that you saw, which was live fire stuff, um, that was a whole lot easier because we were using ranges. But to do a bonfire on a beach uh, had a lot of layers to it, but we got everything approved and did it the right way. But that was about family. And that was about recognizing, you know, their young kids are important to them. Um, family was there when there was a funeral in the film. Um, and families talked about when they have that scene in the coffee shop about, hey, my wife's pregnant. You know, what do you think, chief? Um, so those are the four themes. We also wanted to correct things from Navy SEALs. You know, let's not go, let's not have a sniper shoot through stone walls from an ancient Roman fort because there's no 50 <laughs> cal round that does that. You don't switch to thermal and see, you know, so let's keep it, let's keep it real. Um, so, so we hopefully were, were successful at that. Yeah, it was awesome. Uh, I think you guys, I think you guys nailed it. The se the senior chief when he's doing the interview on the yacht is one of the best scenes. His his acting was incredible. And you told me something interesting about that. Is uh, mm -hmm. were you saying that that was how much of that was scripted versus uh, improvised? It's pretty funny. So that was Derek Van Orden, who is actually running for Congress. And one thing I want to say about all these guys who are in the film too, um, this wasn't the seal to Hollywood program. These were guys who we approached. Um, the, the person, the chief, for example, he's like, Hey, I'm all about my mission training young frogmen. And the reason we preach, we approached the chief was that was his makeup. That was genuine. And, and what I said to him in private was, look, chief, this is about you when you're a master chief, which by the way, he is today. This is about you, um, really helping craft, identifying the character and, and, and building a tool that brings the right people in to serve in the SEAL team later on. And now he is a master chief running training. Um, and he's had a hand in really bringing in what we believe are the right folks through, through this film. When the film was shown, um, before it was released, it was, we did a screening at the White House at the invitation of the president. And uh, we went back there and that same chief, and I'm not mentioning his last name because he's on active duty, mm -hmm. but he had just returned from Afghanistan where he was out in a you know, PRT, a, a small village campaign working with Afghans and SEALs to defend an area of the Afghan countryside. And when he returned home, um, I called him up and said, hey, <clears throat> chief, we're going to the White House. We'd love to have you there. And true to form, he said, hey, sir, I appreciate that in that Staten Island accent. But I got to tell you, you know, this, this, this deployment turned into nine months and, and not all of it was gravy. We lost some of our partner force guys. And if it's all the same to you, I'll skip the White House. My kids and I are going to have a picnic this weekend and then we're going to go to the beach. And I'm like, you are the guy you portrayed in the movie. And he, and he truly is. So um, I, I don't think I answered your question there because you'd asked me something and I think I got a little off track, but I wanted to, to raise that uh, point about the characters who, the SEALs who play those characters. No, I think, you know, you answer, I think you answered it in a way, the question about improvised versus on screen and uh, or oh, on script, yeah. you know, yeah. and yeah, Derek Van Orden, who's running for Congress, that whole interrogation scene was unscripted and the director, Scott Waugh, was not comfortable with that until they started chatting a bit. And he goes, all right, OK, well, we can shoot it a couple ways. Let's go your way. So the gentleman who portrayed the um, the weapons, the arms dealer, the Russian, was actually put without his knowledge in the engine room and oh. which is incredibly hot on a yacht like that. And, and I think someone might have actually uh, visited the thermostat to make sure it remained hot. And he was down there handcuffed for a long, long time, like a long, long time. And then he was brought up, put in the salon of that yacht, sat across from Derek Van Orden and Senior, um, basically started grilling him. And, you know, he's a good actor, and he kind of went through all the right things. Uh, Alex Medved, I think was his name. And then Vano, as we would call him, um, started pulling out things that he learned about the actor's personal life and not all of which are included in the film but every one of which rattled him to the core and so he was hot tired confused was really uncomfortable going into this without a script 
And man, it just, I think it turned into one of the strongest scenes in the film. Oh, for sure. For sure. And, you know, you were talking about family. Um, and obviously there's a big part of this that has to do with the SEAL Family Foundation since supporting that. And you're talking about family. And, you know, the movie actually ends. I think it's the last part of the movie is the letter from father to son, right? Isn't that the, isn't that the yeah. last, the last thing we see is, you know, generation to generation, which is maybe the most, yeah. you know, what we all hope to, uh, to leave behind is another generation of people who've got, who are doing a little bit better than us, right? Every time. And that's yeah. the goal. And I think that that came across, I really came across as far as I'm concerned. I think it was, it was awesome. And I, and I can tell, but maybe you can elaborate that a lot of the, uh, action sequences, particularly where people were, where the seals were wounded are, are all inspired by actual real life stories off the battlefield, the way that they were hurt, killed, uh, you know, one seal in the beginning is shot in the eye. Um, those are, is it true that those are all, uh, basically inspired by true events? It, they absolutely were. And just one thing back to the point you made, raised about family, um, the, the, the SEAL playing the lieutenant kind of fits a lot of our profile things. He was an all-American um, lacrosse player in college. So, I mean, it kind of validates that point about where you seek talent. But additionally, he himself and his own family at the time of filming was going through the process of a first child. And so all that emotion was was pretty genuine and and i think he carried it off wonderfully because it was real for him um yeah the uh you know and i'm sorry the other the other point you asked me about could you could you run that by me one more time we were just uh, oh yeah all the um all the the injuries and the way that yeah. people were were uh wounded in the film yeah we wanted to make sure everything was 100 percent accurate so um there's a gentleman who today um, is a law enforcement officer in the Chicago area, but just big, tough kid. And um, I will, I don't want to share more than I should that's appropriate in this forum, but I'll tell you your, your interview subject, Ben, was the guy who pulled him off the roof when a rifle round went through his eye and out the back of his head. And he, to talk to this, this young, young man, his first, I'll leave his first name is Mark, um, the bullet went in Mark's eye out the back. And as he says, left an exit wound the size of a Gatorade cap. Very specific, but, but man, that's easy to imagine the size of that hole. He walked to the helicopter. Um, I was working at the, at the Bud's compound and he had gone through a pretty serious recovery phase. But what movies don't portray or is not often talked about is wounds are more serious than what a 1960s Western would make you think. Yeah. Um, yep. Along, you've seen this. You've got teammates, Max, who you've seen injured, and um, and it and it's pretty nasty business treating and recovering. And it's why, honestly, there ought to be more more movies honoring the medical community because the things they do from the medevac folks, some of whom are incredibly valorous, and these are these are largely army medevac crews that will fly in. You know, in case of our camp in Afghanistan got hit. Um, there's a medevac crew that, that we went out of our way to thank. They pulled two of our, two of our SEAL buddies off and, and some, some close friends were Green Berets, one of whom didn't make it, uh, first Sergeant Drew McKenna, but you know, those folks are, are, are a whole part of it. Um, you know, the, uh, the notion of the stories off the battlefield, Mark, when he was shot, went, walked to the medevac helicopter, recovered. And then he wanted to get back in the fight. And his whole battle was, I want to be a SEAL again. Um, and they had him instructing at the Bud's compound while they went through further medical treatment. He had a glass eye with a huge trident in it. And this kid went from, I don't think he was ever weak in his life, but he, he really focused on recovering physically. And so you can imagine being a young Bud student and you're there for your knife inspection before a two mile swim. And this buffed out dude who, who literally had a huge wrestling background, but he looks like a college linebacker is staring you down and you notice, oh my God, there's a, a gold trident in one eye. <laughs> that, was, that was Mark and uh, just an amazing guy and a humble guy. And years later, I went to visit boot camp and in one of the stairways, and I think you, you know, they referred to as ships, right? Those buildings. Mm -hmm. Yes. There's, there's a picture of a seal coming out of the water with a gold trident in his eye. So that story was off the battlefield. Um, and, and that's portrayed by Mikey, 
Um, Mike is, uh, is the person who's wounded, the bullet comes through his eye. Um, but, but a number, just about every other story was straight off the battlefield and we wanted to include those um, in the film. And so, it's awesome. And so the question I have, and it might be, you know, burning a hole in everyone's mind right now is uh, you, you do all these things, including Act of Valor, to accomplish this goal of, of writing, basically, you know, correcting the manpower in the teams. And how did it go? So great question. And thank you for following up on that because we never filled a class, but all these, all these different engines that we combined, we don't know which one or two or three of the six or seven made the difference. But in 2007, we, we had our first full class ever in our history. And at that point in time, we went from four classes a year back to five to eventually, for the first time ever, six classes a year, each oh, wow. class full. And today, there's about 210 folks who compete to class up. Uh, and classes, I think, run about 160 students now. And they get whittled down. The standard's the same. But uh, yeah, so we, we are in a position and have been for about the past decade plus where we have all the SEAL candidates that, that we need. And um, to the point, in fact, where I think the community, and I can't speak for the community because I'm not on active duty, but I think with wars in Afghanistan and, and Iraq uh, lessening, um, they've taken the foot off the gas pedal a little bit. And so the demand signal for new SEALs has, has lessened um, and training remains just as tough as ever. But yes, we did solve that manning shortfall. And a lot of those folks who came in in 2006, 2007, 2008, were, were the SEALs who fought and earned the core of those stories that, that today are shared among trainees, the same way the valorous stories of SEALs and their exploits in Vietnam were shared with me when I was a trainee. Yeah, amazing. You know, you were there, your career spans a long period of time, including a break in service where you, I mean, I can't believe we're talking to, some, to you I can't believe that you're the guy responsible for so many great things out of the SEAL community, the Naval Special Warfare community. Um, you have been a part of such iconic moments, uh, frankly, and, and a big part of that, not to in any way suggest that these movies are the, the biggest part, but really it's, the, it's that the Naval Special Warfare community needed people, and people is the number one resource that the military has. And you were there at the time when the Navy special warfare community, the most elite in the world, needed people the most and were put in charge of figuring out how to make that happen at the peak of the violence in Iraq and Afghanistan where, you know, we're fighting wars on and really with a continuing war in Africa and a, and a developing war in PACOM at the time, a, a time where people were spread so thin and, uh, and figuring out ways to recruit people to meet the mission and then you go and you do it and it's incredible and congratulations. But honestly, would you have really wanted it any other way? Well, I'll tell you, I, I feel really honored to have been in a role that I could make a difference, but it was more than just me. I mean, right now, I, I think he's one of the most senior guys in, um, in Airbnb in North America. Uh, someone named Darren Evenson, who's a former SEAL team CEO, um, probably one of the smartest folks I've ever met. And, um, he was a partner in this effort um, because he was at that time the officer community manager. So he really knew what all the levers were and, and, and had that close tie to uh, the Navy personnel folks. Another person, um, uh, Captain Bart Randall, who's still on active duty, but he was the enlisted community manager at that time. And then soon after, he was the commanding officer at SEAL Team 5. And so I partnered with him and and so there was, there was a force there. And then people like Rear Admiral Brian Losey, Rear Admiral Joe McGuire, you know, that was their rank at the time. They're all the commanders. Um, you know, uh, they, they all made a huge difference. Uh, Admiral Ed Winter, all who kind of endorsed and said, hey, we're, especially Admiral McGuire, we are under duress. We need to find these people and, and let's figure out the who and the how. And, um, you know, they, they trusted me to move forward. I trusted, you know, um, uh, Diana Birch, who's the race director in Hawaii to, to treat us well. 
a buddy who was a surface warfare officer who was commander of a cruiser to support that effort on a greater Navy front as well as SEAL Team front. He's now a Vice Admiral, Ron Boxall. You know, we had lots of partners across the board who, who helped us. So I feel good about it. In terms of what some SEALs have done, my, my I've done five combat deployments, but there are those who followed me and came before me that have 12 combat deployments and are wearing silver stars and, you know, all kinds of decorations for valor. So I would do, you know, what I really took pride in, and this is what I would tell a young person, identify what you're good at. If you want someone to lead the recovery mission for a international healthcare worker trapped in Somalia, you probably don't want Duncan Smith to be that guy. You probably want more like a Bart Randall, or if it's an underwater side, you want the former you know, you want the CEO of the SDV team, which is someone like Darren Evenson. Um, but I would go and I would work a variety of missions. My last job was chief of staff for all special operations in Afghanistan. I spent 2015 to 2016 in Afghanistan. And, and I valued that role. And, and I spent a lot of time all over the country. Um, and I think I was making a difference. But there are a lot of SEALs with a ton, ton of experience that, you know, I don't hold a candle to there. But where I do feel I made a difference is, you know, I'm a guy with an MBA mentored by this young woman named Melinda French. When I did my business school internship at Microsoft, Melinda French was kind of like Admiral Eric Olson. She listens, she hears everything from these brand managers, and then she says it in like seven words, and you now have a marketing plan. And, and she later went on to become Melinda Gates. Mm -hmm. um, but I was a 33-year-old post-platoon commander learning leadership lessons from this 26 year old MBA with a computer science degree. Um, so, so I feel, you know, I learned stuff when I was, I was an RA and then I ran a, a low income housing unit, a HUD section eight building before I finished college. And I learned stuff from community members that made me a better person in my role of trying to bring diverse candidates who met the standard into the SEAL teams. And so I think we're all kind of the sum of our own experiences. And I would tell a young person, um, you know, aspire to be your best, recognize where you have certain skills uh, and try to highlight those skills uh, and, and polish those skills, but, but try to be good at everything, but recognize, um, you know, what your, what your strength is. So long-winded answer to a simple question. Yeah, I'm really pleased that I could make that difference at the right time. I love that. Yeah. I love that. Be good at everything and be the best at what you're the best at. I love that. Um, you know, we've been going here for almost two hours now. You and I have been on this, oh, on kidding. this conversation. Wow. I had just looked okay. at the clock and realized how long we've been going. Um, I want to, I want to give you the opportunity. Um, and I don't know if you want to pivot back to the seal family foundation. I do have this, uh, this link that I was given for the video. If you wanted me to show this 30 second video, um, to people who are, who are on this call. It's this, uh, the slideshow that was forwarded to me about from the family foundation. Um, if you want, I can, I can show that to the audience here. Would you please, if you could share the screen. Yep. So, uh, and then while that's, while that's going on, I'll just kind of highlight a little bit of what you see. You're, you're not seeing names, you're not seeing faces. Um, so you have to recognize this film is representative of what we do, but we are very careful when we go to a graduation or an event with family, you know, we might focus on, sharply focus on the, the food or what, what we're providing. Um, but, but the people are often blurred. So. All right. Um, so let me know. You'll hear it. Um, and then people uh, at home will be able to see this right now. I'm going to start playing it. So it's playing right now. There's, I don't know if there's an audio component to this, but, uh, it is, we're seeing the photos of everyone, uh, at the event here, at the events, the various events. So what I would tell people too, if they, if they choose to um, make a difference in, in bringing families together to allow SEALs and special warfare combatant craft crewmen to continue to support the nation and our national defense, I'd ask people to consider the SEAL Family Foundation as a vehicle to support that effort. We're at sealfamilyfoundation.org. That's our website, all one word, sealfamilyfoundation.org. And you're going to see on your screen here that you can also text the word SEAL to, uh, I believe it's 24365. Is that, That's is that right. correct? That's right. Yep. 24365. Text USA 
to 24-365 to assist us in supporting the evacuation of American citizens and those Afghanis that have helped the U.S. these past 20 years, as well as other, you know, I'm sure you'll get other information. That's if you text the USA, but the number here is 24365. We also have an event in Philadelphia on April 28th if people would like to attend that. Um, we're going to have SEALs present, but uh, it's, a, it's a gala event where we're going to talk about the work we do. We'll have some Gold Star spouses speaking, as well as some, some SEAL members. And, um, and actually in Denver on April 6th, we've got a private event, a reception that if people are interested, they can go to sealfamilyfoundation.org and uh, request more information on that. Awesome. I think we do have some listeners out in Philadelphia who maybe will uh, want to check that out. So I want to give you the opportunity here to, uh, to say anything that, um, that you'd like to the audience or to me directly or however, whatever is on your mind, uh, if there's something that we didn't get to or something that you want to, uh, to share, the floor is yours. Well, I'll tell you, Max, what you're doing is amazing. And, and there's such, so much information out there, some of which is valid, some of which isn't. And, you know, your podcast, I really appreciate the opportunity to be a part of it. I think the manner in which you you share information and, and the manner in which you uh, conduct interviews, um, that you're you're something I'm I am now subscribed to and will continue to be subscribed to. So it's an honor to be a part of it. Um, I also think too recognizing that you know for young people, those men and women, um, you know who are considering what they want to do with their life. If you're looking for a purpose, you're looking for a mission. I think it's pretty popular right now to look past the military, to look past some sort of conventional routes. But, but get to know some of the men and women who, who served in uniform and, and learn from them because everything from, you know, if you're looking to go to med school, there are, you know, Navy, Army, Air Force scholarships for that thing, uh, that, that kind of training. Um, there is a whole wealth of opportunity in the military. Is it for everyone? No. But it is a great start to head out and move on to other things. For, for years, the head of astronaut training at NASA, Chris Cassidy, a guy I shared a tent with in Afghanistan. Um, a former SEAL who, who went on to lead all of the space training for all astronauts in NASA. Um, we already mentioned Michael Crook, who led a number of organizations and people like Darren Evenson who've gone on to do great things in their lives. And, and your listeners will too, particularly the young people as they try to figure out their way. Um, so appreciate the opportunity to share with them. I, I would tell people, trust your intuition as you think about what you want to do in life. For those people who are on the far end of their career and they're looking to hire young, talented people, Please consider veterans as folks to hire, uh, but most importantly, make sure that character is a component in your search for talent within your organization. Um, thank you so much, Max, for having me. I really appreciate it. Yeah, thank you for being here. I'm truly humbled by what you said, um, and the pleasure and honor is all mine to hear um, a little bit about your really, truly fascinating life, and thank you uh, for sharing all of your accomplishments and a little bit about your career with us today. I know people in the audience really enjoyed it. And if you, uh, if you don't mind, stay on the line and I am going to close out the episode and I'll be back with you in a moment, Duncan. Sounds good. Thanks. So guys, that is, uh, and I mean, what an incredible story. Uh, thank you, Duncan Smith, for joining us today. Thank you guys for watching that episode. If you can, please, the most important thing you could do for me today is go check out sealfamilyfoundation.org and see how you can get involved. If that's a, uh, program that you want to support. They are out there taking care of tons of people. Thankfully, I never had to turn to the SEAL Family Foundation for anything when I was serving in Naval Special Warfare, but just the fact that, you know, they're out there and knowing that they have your back when you're going back to back deployments 300 days a year, traveling, you know, stuff like that. It's, it's really amazing. And the fact that he would choose to continue to serve after such a long career in the teams is, uh, is, is awesome. I hope you guys learned something cool today and make sure you guys stick around for many more exciting and interesting interviews to come in the future. It's going to be a great road ahead of us here on the Scuttlebutt Show. Thank you for joining me today. With all that being said, I look forward to talking to you guys very soon. And for now, that's the Scuttlebutt. What you just said is one of the most insanely idiotic things I have ever heard. At no point in your rambling, incoherent response were you even close to anything that could be considered a rational thought. Everyone in this room is now dumber for having listened to it. I award you no points, and may God have mercy on your soul.